So in the chapter I asked you to read, we're looking at several different time analysis and your lab will uh, actually do a few of those tests. And honestly, you're repeating some of the tests that we've done, but you're breaking up the data into uh, two different periods and then doing a comparison, adding just a comparison between those. So a few of the types of analysis that were discussed in the textbook. Uh, first, a horizontal analysis. Uh, that's where you're comparing, comparing the balances of current period to a prior period. So you're uh, looking at the balances of all of your expense types accounts and you're comparing this year to last year. Um, it could also be done with other types of tests. Uh, then a vertical analysis. This is more looking at uh, kind of more of a ratio or comparison. So think about your balance sheet. You would uh, convert each number to a percentage of the total. So percentage of the total assets, percentage of the total liabilities and equity, and compare those percentages year over year. Because maybe your total assets are the same, but um, accounts receivable is sky high compared to the rest, and you've had a decrease in inventory. So that gives us just a little bit more depth, especially when you could uh, do both of these analysis to further look for fraud. And then we're looking at elements of a balance. So uh, let's start with anything that uh, you have a subsidiary ledger. Easy enough. Um, so you're comparing purchases from each vendor to the prior year. All of a sudden you have a vendor that you've never heard of, uh, maybe is a type of vendor that is more easily fraudulent, say services, and there's a huge spike. Uh, so these are things to look at there. You can also look at it uh, uh, over sales, cost of sales, anything that has a lot of components that make up that. And then a uh, comparison of ratio or financial relationships. So this could be a, your descriptive um, statistics, as well as looking at things as inventory turnover, current ratio, all of those things, and you're comparing year over year. You know, and just because there's a change, but, you know, some of these can be easily explainable based on uh, economic conditions, changes in the business, etc. But those that are not definitely need to be further examined. All right, so your Chapter 7 lab actually looks, has you perform several tests, which you have done before, and analyze these. Uh, so you'll... But the easiest way is to separate the data into two samples. One of the recommendations I give in uh, the actual directions is to just put the 2015 data on one tab, uh, 2016 on another, and then you do your analysis of each separately and then bring it together to compare. Uh, how you organize, I'll kind of leave it up to you. There's some suggestions in the written lab, but um, you'll get to the right answers. I do want to talk a little bit what's in the chapter, uh, chapter 10, which I did not have you read, but there's some other ways to look at change. Uh, if you just take a peek at pages 276 and 278, you'll see why we didn't get into it. The math is actually rather complex, but I want to go over some of the basics of uh, what we are calling um, a vector variation test or ve vector variation size. Uh, you'll call it, you'll see it called a different things. What it's doing is looking at groups of, of data. So we're trying to look at it a little bit more on a line by line level. So this example is, let's say we have a town uh, where the total population is 48. Really, really, really small town, smaller than most of us even uh, live in. So there's three blocks in this town. And when we do our 2020 census, we have a total population of uh, 48. And when we do our 2030 census, we also have a population of 48. So when we're just looking at size at that macro level, there's no change. But we want to know, is there a change on a unit by unit, or in this case, block by block? This town is a three whole blocks. Um, and that's where we see some change. So blocks one and two, if you look at the numbers here, there is a difference of increase of eight in each of those, and we decrease 16. So there are different sizes comparable in each. 
So it's not looking at, so it's looking at whether the change is consistent between all elements. Uh, this is a technique that could be used. Um, their systems don't seem to use it from what uh, the, the textbook authors suggest, but it could be used to determine potentially fraudulent returns, especially the um, tax refunds. Uh, we're going to talk about a case, and I'm actually probably, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Negrini, uh, our author, because he does a better job explaining some of the things uh, and has all pictures of all the documents and the fraud of, of somebody who uh, about 20 years ago was a celebrity, so you may not recognize the picture. So we're looking at the ta tax case of Richard Hatch. And that name may not ring a bell with all of you, but he was actually the first winner of Survivor in 2020, in 2000, sorry. Uh, so the prize at that time was a million dollars. So this should have shown a significant increase in the amount of income he had and, of course, the amount of tax that he received. He also received another $10,000 and... The IRS did receive a 1099 MISC from the show's producers for $1,010,000, which was a significant increase from his income that he had. So I'm going to turn it over to, uh, as I said, uh, our textbook authors. And I'm starting in the, I will post this, uh, the link to this, but we're starting halfway in the middle where he talks about this case. Okay, it seems that uh, the audio from this is not catching up. So I'm going to put a link out there and tell you at what timestamp to start if uh, I'm unable to. So watch the link from um, the textbook on the case for Richard Hatch. Uh, what we're looking for is this is a case where if the IRS was doing this testing because of the information they received from the producer, they would have expected a large increase in the income, um, which you'll see did not happen. And so you'll see kind of some of the steps uh, in the court case of and whether or not he was found guilty or not of tax evasion. So I will have this link separately. Sorry, I was hoping to just integrate it into one, but uh, take a look at that. You will watch about eight minutes of this video and I'll have the timestamps. All right. <laughs> 